Okay, great. Well, we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so nice to see you. I think as many of you know, my name's Robin Speedy. I work with Nourish and around the anchor cohort work. Um, so we're excited to be hosting our first cross cohort webinar now since the launch of the anchor cohort at the symposium in September. Uh, so this will be the first of many webinars that we host during the program. Uh, some will be more educational and knowledge building and others will be about sharing with each other, connecting and peer learning. So today we're going to be covering a few things. Um, I'm going to start us off just by reviewing our Nourish Clover, um, which is the guide for our time together and the phasing of the program. Some of you will have seen that already at our launch, but some of you may not have. So we're just going to revisit that to set things up. Um, and then we have some guests today from the Waterloo Institute of Social Innovation and Resilience, which is called WISER for short. And they're going to take us through a problem statement exercise, including some time for discussion and breakout groups. Maya and Amy from the Nourish team will be sharing some more about upcoming opportunities uh, for the Anchor Cohort to integrate with our action learning series, Food is Our Medicine and Planetary Health Menus. And then we'll wrap by 2.30 Eastern with a recap of some of the next steps and any questions that folks might have. So hopefully that sounds okay. Uh, we've got quite a bit to cover, so I'm just gonna dive right in. All right, so. The Nourish Clover. Some of you will be familiar with this already, and it's probably new to at least a few of you. Um, but this is something that we'll come back to frequently. Um, it's kind of our compass, our guide as we move through the two years in the anchor cohort together. And it's meant to illustrate the different phases of work and provide a bit of structure of the different um, the different timing and frameworks that have been incorporated into the way that we're designing this program. So most importantly, it, it's a synthesis of many different systems change frameworks um, that underlie the approach we're using in the cohort. So those include things like design thinking, theory U, eight shields, the medicine wheel, um, eco cycle or adaptive cycle. Um, and if these names aren't familiar to you, that is 100% okay, um, but we may be bringing you back to them at various points in the work. And this clover is kind of a culmination of lots of those different thinking uh, schools of thought that have gone into, um, yeah, how, we, how we've designed things. So it's really meant to be an awareness-based ecological model for a structured approach to systems change. And I'm just gonna take you briefly through the four loops of the clover now to give you a sense of how it works. So we start with sensing the system that we're in. So that's kind of where we are right now. And this is about going deep on understanding your problem space from a range of different perspectives. So this phase is about identifying and exploring blind spots. We all have them, uh, suspending judgment and empathizing with those who experience the problem space most deeply. So the met metaphor here is kind of subterranean and we're in the soil exploring where we are with curiosity and an open mind and open heart. And we liken this phase to the season of winter, which is kind of more about hibernation and reflection. So we'll be encouraging you to lean into introspection, to reflect and understand and deepen your awareness um, as we grow together through the cohort. The next phase that we move on to is surfacing, and that's about surfacing new insights about that system that we're in. So we cross the threshold from the soil to the sun, and we look back on how we got here. So the surfacing phase is about letting go of past assumptions and preconceptions that shape our understanding of the world, refining our focus to envision what could be, uh, preparing to organize ourselves for ideation and exploring new possible futures in the shaping phase, and defining what we want to work on. So thinking about how we can reorganize what we see in the system around us so that it can come together in new ways and thrive. So the metaphor here is about spring. Um, it's a spring of potential with new growth and opportunities at the start of a new season. The third phase is shaping. Um, so shaping the system is um, about thinking about our understanding of what's going on and how we can influence it to lead to a better future. So developing interventions and practices that can better meet the needs of the people in that system as well as the planet. And it's kind of straddling the worlds below and above ground. So you can see um, in the graphic there, it's about testing ideas that are promising, experimenting with new ways of thinking and doing, crystallizing the quality of the future that could be and how we can get there. 
So the shaping phase is um, likened to exploiting the resources and potential um, and will for that preferred future to come to be. And the season that it's associated with is summer, which is like a very active phase, kind of hard work under the sun, um, putting in a lot of effort to yield a strong harvest in the fall. And then the last loop of our clover is about scaling. And this one used to be sustaining, um, but we've evolved it a little bit um, for this next cohort based on the learning from the last group. So that last loop is about embedding what's working and expanding on it and where appropriate, thinking about how it can be spread and scaled uh, to maximize impact. So staying resilient and acknowledging that systems are always shifting and they'll always continue to evolve. So we know that change is dynamic, but the idea and the hope is that a new future will be emerging. So this clover is a continuous loop that connects back into ongoing sensing, surfacing, and shaping activities. And as we go through our time together, we'll encourage you to hold on to what is working, but also to identify and let go of things that might not be working as well. So uh, right now we're starting in this sensing phase, as I said. Um, and you can also think about it as a timeline where we move through, you know, now in the fall and early winter of next year, focusing on sensing and surfacing, and then early next year, kind of around February, March time, probably shifting into our shaping. But um, it's, it's also deeper than just a timeline. So the clover is trying to hold space for many ways of knowing, and we're not committing to one model or approach for systems change. Um, instead, the clover is a way to respect and acknowledge the many models and ways of thinking that underlie it. And in this way, we're hoping to move toward decolonizing practices and, and moving with humility and respect toward promoting more relational systems thinking. So as part of leaning into this sensing and surfacing phase, we're excited to host this problem statement webinar today. And the idea is that it will help you hone in on the problems that you're looking to address in your work. And the reason we want to take some time to do that is we wanna make sure we're addressing the right problems and not just symptoms of other deeper problems, which could lead us to solutions that are not the right fit for the real issues at hand. So I'm very excited to be introducing our guest speakers today. Dan McCarthy is the co-director of the Waterloo, in Waterloo Institute of Social Innovation and Resilience, so WISER, and he's the Associate Director of Undergraduate Studies as well as an Associate Professor in the School of Environment, Resource and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. So Dan's research focuses on complexity, resilience, social innovation and inner transformation. And then alongside Dan, we have Aaron Alexia. And Aaron is a seasoned researcher practitioner with over 10 years of experience working with change makers to catalyze systems change and drive impact across Canada. And Aaron works with both Nourish and Wiser. Her work is cross sectoral and intercultural with a focus on well being, sustainability, and the inner dimensions of systems change. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I will pass it over to Dan and Aaron to take us through our workshop today. Thank you so much, Robin. That was perfectly timed. I'm just watching the run of show and it's like, <laughs> yeah, well done. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Dan. I'm a prof here at the University of Waterloo. I'm coming to you from the traditional territory, the uh, Anishinaabe, the, six, or the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit River and the uh, Haudenosaunee the, and their uh, of, of Six Nations of the Grand River and their Haldeman Tract. Um, I, work with a, and co-teach with an Anishinaabe elder who is married to uh, a Haudenosaunee elder. And I'm always careful to just flip the order of those two so I don't get in trouble with either of them, but I always manage to get myself in trouble. So um, anyway, so yeah, welcome everybody. And thank you so much for, for your time today. Uh, Aaron, I think you can, unless you wanna say a couple of words, uh, you can start sharing the, the deck that we've prepared. So, um, I have been studying complexity and systems thinking for a, a very long time and trying uh, to apply these ideas in lots of different contexts, lots of different uh, practical projects. A lot of my research is uh, you know, practice oriented, community based. Um, I've had the privilege of working with a number of Indigenous nations uh, here in Ontario on the West Coast, as well as a number of Indigenous-led organizations um, and a lot of environmental movement organizations as well. And uh, always uh, try to 
humbly bring some of these ideas uh, to bear in, in that kind of work, but also have been involved in the development of a lot of professional development uh, and, and undergraduate and graduate programming as well through Wiser and with uh, uh, colleagues like Francis Wesley. Um, and so uh, bring to you some, some tools that we hope to, to offer you today that are based on systems and complexity ideas but also hope to uh, to bring a bit of a, a sort of a diagnostic or almost psychotherapeutic lens to this work as well. Uh, Aaron, you can go to the next slide. So you might be asking what is systems thinking and you will hear, and if you read about uh, systems thinking, uh, if you want some references, there's tons of them out there, systems and complexity ideas. I've got, you know, several bookshelves and a whole bunch of online uh, books and, and articles. But uh, one really good one, if you haven't come across it, is Danella Meadows. Uh, I think it's just called Introduction to Systems Thinking. It's a really good place to start, but there are many, many others. And if you want some other references, please come back to me. Um, but the way I tend to think about systems thinking and the way that I've been taught by my, my he's now unfortunately passed away, thermodynamicist, uh, physicist, PhD supervisor is, is that it is a lens um, and uh, a way of looking at the world, one that really emphasizes um, uh, a more holistic, uh, less uh, sort of reductive kind of approach. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with reductionism. We've learned an enormous amount, but sometimes we forget to put things back together. And a systems approach and complexity ideas really help us to do that, looking for connections and relationships and really foregrounding uh, relationships and connections uh, rather than maybe things. Uh, another a key component of this, and this is interesting, having you know been taught by a physicist, is that a plurality of perspectives and multiple perspectives is incredibly important in understanding complexity. And of course, this is borne out in a lot of the other work that I've done in uh, you know, community-based research and cross-cultural context. But um, even if you just look at some of the uh, work done by people like Peter Checkland and his approach to soft systems thinking um, a few decades ago really emphasizes the importance of a diversity of perspectives and being able to enrich the picture of our understanding of complex systems because no matter where we are, we always end up with a particular lens um, and that is effectively bounded. And uh, one of the best ways of breaking that bounded rationality, which we'll get to uh, in a few minutes, is to encounter and work with respectfully and humbly other perspectives. The other piece is uh, working with paradox and embracing complexity, not trying to reduce it. Much of our work is, is often associated with trying to reduce complexity, reduce, you will have heard of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, VUCA. Um, we often work to reduce complexity where, in fact, one of the things that, that I've been taught through this work and that's been really uh, incredibly helpful to me is the idea of embracing complexity and embracing uncertainty and surprise and being able to sit with that um, and uh, be, building the resilience, the capacity to sit in volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous contexts and, and not be overwhelmed. And I'll probably be citing a colleague of mine, uh, Vanessa Andriotti, who is a decolonial education scholar who emphasizes the same kinds of things because she brings a complexity lens to her work. So that's essentially, you know, when I talk about systems thinking, that's what I'm speaking about. Go ahead, Aaron. And thank you for advancing the slides. So this is a little video. Um, a little video by Dave Snowden, just making the distinction between simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic, and it's kind of funny. So just uh, let's imagine, if you on. can, that you've got to organize a party for a bunch of eleven-year-old boys, and you want to apply the three different types of system that apply in nature. Well, if you assume the party's chaotic, the children are acting at random. You might as well buy the drugs and alcohol so the children can go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Your house may burn down in the process, but what does that matter? All property is theft, and it was socially constructed in the first place. Um, I have friends in California who've tried this. I don't recommend it. Um, the recovery cost is high, but it's a legitimate approach. On the other hand, the one we'll be more familiar with is the ordered systems approach. Here, it's of critical importance to construct clearly articulated learning objectives in advance of the party itself. The learning objective should, of course, be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong. Ideally, you should print the learning objectives off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys 
and water dropping into ponds and place those around the room where you're going to hold the party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. Um, once you've done that, you know, the senior adult can start the party with a motivational videotape. After all, you don't want the children wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the objectives of the party and to show the children how pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Now, of course, the third approach, the complexity approach, is even simpler. Here we draw a line in the sand known as a boundary in complexity theory and we turn to the children and say cross that you little bastards and you die. And one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible negotiable boundaries because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. We then use catalytic probes and I'm deliberately using the jargon of complexity theory now. A football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game something which will stimulate a pattern of activity which is called an attractor. And if it's a beneficial attractor, we stabilize it, we amplify it. If it's a negative attractor, we dampen it or destroy it fairly quickly. So what we do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And in that simple phrase, we see the promise of complexity theory for organizations and government alike. Thanks, Aaron. So, um, so Dave Snowden uh, uh, has developed a, uh, a an approach called the Kenevan framework. Uh, it's a Welsh word meaning um, places of many belonging, uh, and it's a really useful little framing. and And he does a lot of work in in the field of complexity. Um, yeah, a lot of very funny little videos like that. And apologies for the the tongue in cheek and some some profanity in there, but it's a uh, it's one way of articulating the differences between these types of systems. And oftentimes when I show that, people will sort of snicker at the, uh, especially the ordered systems approach, but then they'll be like, yeah, we just did that. You know, that, that, that kind of very well-planned strategic planning kind of approach that, you know, 95% of strategic plans fail. Um, it, it really is just to sort of highlight that there are different ways of approaching uh, different kinds of systems. And when we think about uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous contexts, and um, useful to maybe let go of some of the approaches that we have unconsciously and generally taken uh, and, and practice some discernment and think a little bit about um, ways that we can uh, approach, you know, complex situations differently. So this little distinction here is by a colleague, a late colleague of ours, Brenda Zimmerman, who was also a complexity scholar. And she actually did a lot of work with uh, in the healthcare sector. Uh, she worked with doctors and hospital administrators, uh, um, you know, lot, lots of people in, in, the, in the healthcare sector, um, trying to articulate, um, you know, the, the value of a complexity based framing. And so she made this distinction between simple, complicated and complex, which is not unlike uh, what, what Dave Snowden just articulated there. Um, but uh, she used this, this metaphor of baking a cake versus sending a rocket to the moon versus raising a child. And it's, it sounds overly simplistic, but it's a useful way of making these kinds of distinctions. And you can think about this as a, as a tool for practicing discernment. Are we, um, are we approaching problems unconsciously hoping that they are simple rather than maybe complicated or complex? And so in the, in the case of baking a cake, the recipe is essential and no particular expertise is required, but experience increases the rate of success. And as somebody who's done some baking over the years, I can attest to this. Sending a rocket to the moon, rigid protocols and high expertise are really important. Um, Whereas raising a child, uh, rigid protocols have a, a limited application. Have, I have two daughters and they are very different people and different approaches to them. Uh, one would, would respond very well to different kinds of parenting approaches, uh, you know, as I was raised, guilt trips and that kind of thing. And the other one would just rebuff them. So expertise helps, but only when balanced with responsiveness to a particular child or situation. So again, I'm offering these distinctions both as a, a way of articulating the distinction between these kinds of systems, but also a bit of a, a tool for discernment. Am I unconsciously hoping that this is a simple system when maybe it's more usefully thought of as complex? And again, thinking about that as a lens. Go ahead, Aaron. So this is really, really brief, uh, and it'll just be sort of a, a show of hands, but I, I often get people to do this. 
Uh, I'd like you to just uh, think of, uh, of a color. Uh, you can write it down if you like, or just have it in your mind. Um, and then think of a flower, and then think of a piece of furniture. And again, just think of, you know, just the first thing that comes to mind. And, and I'll just, you know, with a, with a show of hands, how many people when I ask for a color said red or blue? Uh, how many people when I asked for a flower said uh, rose or daisy? Anybody? And then how many people uh, when I said piece of furniture said couch or chair? Anybody? Okay, so this is this is based on uh, oh, this is Dan Simon's work. I, I can't remember. Sorry, it's, I, I should have had that up there. A, a psychologist that articulated that about eighty percent of people when asked about a color will say red or blue. When they're asked about a flower, they'll say rose or daisy, and, and when they're asked about uh, a piece of furniture, they'll say couch or chair. And so we have these entrained patterns that we fall prey to, and they are associated with our mental models, and our socialization plays an incredibly strong role in the way we approach problems to the point where we uh, undiscerningly and unconsciously fall prey to these entrained patterns. And the examples are many, but I mean, you can even just think about uh, our language, our, our disciplinary uh, sort of training, uh, our culture, these all kind of speak to uh, and entrain us into ways of thinking. One of my favorite distinctions is in English, 70 some odd percent of the words are nouns, where in a language like Anishinaabe Moen, 70 something percent of the words are verbs. And so, you know, huge difference in terms of a verb-based language versus a, a noun-based language. And again, this speaks to the way that our brain works. And so our brain is just being thermodynamically efficient. And so most of the time we miss some really important things all around us because we're focused on particular task at hand. And so, you know, our brain functions in, in uh, certain kinds of ways, most of the time using this sort of novelty receptive, which is incredibly quick, 20 million items per second. That's sort of the things you learn while camping, fire hot, knife sharp, you pull your hand away. And, and the novelty receptive uh, function of our brain only kicks in when those first fit pattern matches don't work. Um, and so we then have to you know, deploy this much slower and more arduous kind of function of our brain, which is this novelty receptive, which you know, processes things at only like 20,000 uh, items per, spectre, or per second um, and only kicks in when those, like I say, we, that's when we're, we're thinking about a best fit pattern match versus a first fit pattern match. And so we're always making decisions based on these sort of entrained patterns, be it our, our language, our culture, um, our disciplinary background, our training, or, or even our, our, our upbringing, our psychology, our, our, uh, you know, the kinds of things that you might bring up with uh, in conjunction with your therapist. Go ahead, Aaron. And I joke about therapy, but I, uh, it is actually something that is a big part of my life. And I've been reading a lot about psychotherapy as someone who's tries, trying to understand systems change. And that's in part because uh, we often fall prey to this, this concept that I mentioned earlier, which is right out of systems and complexity ideas, which is this notion of bounded rationality. And this is a definition by Herbert Simon. So in decision-making, the rationality of individuals is limited by the information they have, the cognitive limitations of their minds, and the find out, finite amount of time they have to make a decision. And I often just go like this when I talk about bounded rationality, because we often unconsciously deploy boundaries that we're not even aware of. And again, they can be associated with our, you know, our training, our culture, our language. They are unconscious and I have them right up to my face because you can't see the edges of them. It isn't until you have them pulled away and you start to experience other forms of, uh, or other ways of knowing or being, um, other, other uh, lived experience that you start to see, oh my gosh, I have a boundary that I'm deploying. Um, and, and eventually you're able to break that bounded rationality. And the problem is, a lot of times things that make sense when you're looking at a system like this don't make much sense when you pull them away and, and uh, look at them in a very different way. Um, and go ahead, Aaron. So this is just a quote by Mark Twain and I think it speaks to everything that I've been trying to get to up until this point. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Oftentimes we fall prey to these entrained patterns. We fall prey to approaches that we've taken that seem to work, those first fit pattern matches. And if we don't figure out ways to build the capacity to see those patterns, to interrupt those patterns and to practice some discernment, we will end up making unfortunate mistakes. And we will look at systems and hope that we're seeing the system when actually uh, we're probably only seeing a very small part of the system. 
So in, one way of sort of getting uh, to a bit of a different understanding of the system is uh, this notion of the iceberg model, which is used by Peter Senge, and, and uh, I know Melanie Goodchild often uses this when she speaks on systems. And so the idea is that most of the time, the kinds of things that we're interacting with are events, catching a cold, um, whereas down below the water level and things that we don't necessarily see are these patterns or trends. Um, like catching a cold is more often associated with being tired or, you know, repeated, uh, uh, you know, uh, overuse of, of uh, different faculties. And so, and then down below that, we have this idea of systemic structures, and these can be things like feedback loops, lack of rest from excessive work. And down below that, we have things that, that we would label as mental models, but if you can even think about them as, you know, paradigms, there's lots of words that can be used here. Um, and, and these are things that, that incentivize us to behave in certain ways. So identity as a hard worker, um, ways that society uh, views work and work-life balance, the way our parents have instilled certain kinds of values in us. These may be kind of deep-seated mental models, which are very difficult to let go and oftentimes really difficult to see. So we in, you know, invite this kind of approach where we look at the events obviously we don't want to discount those but then see what kinds of patterns or trends are reinforcing those events and then what are the systemic structures that are reinforcing those patterns and then you know this is where it comes back to the self and the inner work because our, our even our mental models impact the way that we're we're seeing the system and so those end up becoming very intertwined in a lot of ways and and can even get to the point where it's kind of philosophical so this is a good point in a process early on uh, to ask some of these questions, because you may have a very clear idea of what's wrong in a particular situation. And it's sometimes really useful to be able to say, do I have the right, you know, the resolution to this difficult problem or, or a solution? Am I wedded to that system? Is it part of my, is it part of, you know, how I value myself? Is it, is it something that is making me look good or feel good rather than something that is actually going to help the situation? So that's where these mental models come in. Go ahead, Aaron. So this is uh, very much tied to the previous slide is uh, this notion of uh, uh, Danella Meadows, I mentioned her earlier, and these ideas of leverage points. And most of the time when people ask about how to make change, it's things like the constants and parameters. We just need more money. We just need more people. Whereas if you start to think about how to actually have leverage on a system, and I, I mentioned this part way down that iceberg, we can think about feedback loops. Or at the very end uh, of the of that, proverbial uh, a pull there to have leverage on the system, we might think about things like mindsets or paradigms or the ability to transcend paradigms. Um, we don't often get to that point and those are incredibly potent leverage points. Go ahead, Aaron. So part of this uh, and today is ob obviously to offer uh, some tools and ideas around systems, some basics, which for some of you, this may be really obvious. Um, and in that way, it's prescriptive in the sense of I am sort of telling you what to think. But I'm also offering this as an opportunity to do a bit of diagnosis and think a little bit about how you think. So prescriptive, what to think, descriptive, uh, how you think. And so as we're going through this, I, I invite you, I, you know, I'm not a psychotherapist and no need to share things that are going to make anybody uncomfortable, but you can just watch yourself. And if you find yourself getting frustrated, scared, you know, uncomfortable, watch those kinds of moments. It's like getting really frustrated with the exercise or with an idea, or as we get down to the bottom of the iceberg, you're finding yourself really frustrated. That may be really useful. There may be some cues there to think a little bit about and reflect on what is, what is landing there? What is it? Why is that affective response being drawn out? Jung would have called that a complex. There's probably a little pattern of thought and behavior there, which we have used and maybe needs to be interrupted. So uh, in that way, I offer that as a diagnostic piece. Go ahead, Aaron. So this comes to this piece of we often come into a particular problem uh, with a question or a resolution or a solution, and it seems really obvious to us. And so this is an opportunity to say why. And I uh, was just uh, working with uh, some pro professional development uh, attendees at a, at a course of being taught with Vanessa Andriotti. And this was a question that came up. You know, why, despite our best efforts, have we been unable to make meaningful change on the particular problem? And um, it, this can lead to, you know, deeper, you know, further movement down the iceberg and hopefully a little bit further movement along that that leverage uh, point that, that Danella Meadows talks about. 
even just asking that kind of potent question, why, can help you move down the iceberg a little bit so that maybe you reframe uh, the way that you think about the system, but also uncover some patterns about the way that you think about the system itself. So uh, that, that sort of inner outer transformation piece. So what we want you to do is uh, we often refer to this exercise as the five whys. And it's like uh, one of those sort of annoying little kids that might just continuously ask a question, but why, why is the sky blue? But why? And we want you to play with that a little bit and think about this as structured play. And again, if you're finding resistance to that, watch that resistance. What is the frustration there? Are you hoping for a solution very quickly? Because uh, in many complex problems, solutions don't manifest that easily. And oftentimes, if we approach things through a simplistic lens, we can make really big mistakes. So this is an opportunity to, to ask some of those difficult questions. So I'm going to hand it over to Robin. And I think I'm a little over time. Apologies. Go ahead. No, that's okay. That's great. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Just going through the the different way you set that up, I think is really helpful and framing the, the next piece of what we're going to do. So we're going to move into some breakout conversations and we're going to have those organized by team. So I'll launch a breakout group you'll see five rooms pop up and you can just join the one that is associated with your team, obviously. Um, but before we do that, I just want to briefly give an introduction to the virtual engagement software that we're going to use for the exercise, which is Miro. So um, be patient with me if you're familiar with Miro already. Um, but if you're not, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but you will catch on pretty fast. So I'm um, just going to share my screen again to give you a sense of what to expect here. And then um, we'll move you into those breakout conversations as quickly as possible. So, um, so yeah, Miro is a, a way for us to engage online. Obviously, there's going to be sessions that we do virtually. And so this provides us with a shared whiteboard space where we can collaborate and all add comments and contribute our thoughts and also a place to house some of the resources and slide decks and recordings and information that will be made available to you in, in the cohort. So it's a little bit of a resource hub as well. Um, and each team is going to have their own Miro board, which is your space to collaborate amongst yourselves and you can add new things to their post-its, comments, and, and so on. So you'll have your own team space um, that's unique to you and yours to customize as you like. Um, so this is what it will look like. Um, and on the left, you'll see there's a little image of the clover and where we are at right now um, in terms of that process. And you'll also see a link to download the slides from today. So both the slides from Nourish as well as the slides from Wiser. And then after the session, we'll also post the recording of the webinar there once it's uploaded onto YouTube. So you'll be able to access it. And there's just a couple of tools and navigation um, that I wanna show you. So there's some basic navigation on the left side. Um, the main one I would point out is just the arrow at the top that will allow you to toggle between selecting fields in the board and moving around the board. So it switches from a grabby hand to an arrow, depending on which mode you're in. Um, so if you're having trouble, try switching that and it might help you. There's a little text button there that allows you to type text into your board. Um, and then there's also a little square button underneath the T that is a post-it note. So you can add your own extra thought on the side if you wanna just capture something from the conversation that way. And then in the bottom right, you'll see a plus and minus button that will allow you to zoom in and out on your board. Um, so depending on your mouse, you may also be able to do that with your scroll wheel or fingers on a trackpad. Um, and then just at the end of the session, when you go back in, if you click on those two slide decks, you'll see um, once you hit on it, there will be a little menu that pops up and it will have arrows and you can actually view the slide decks right in Miro there, or you can use the download button to download them as PDFs. So a couple of options for you, but this is the space that we'll be working in. And uh, Dan and Aaron, thanks for giving me just a minute to introduce it because we haven't had a chance to do that yet. This is our first webinar. So what I'm going to do now is paste each team's board into the chat and join that before you leave so that you can make sure you're into the Miro board. Um, and then once we've got those, we'll move you into the breakouts. You shouldn't need a login. Um, you should be able to just go in as a guest. But uh, if you do create a free account, then you'll just be able to unlock more features in Miro. You can do that after the webinar today. Okay, 
So make sure you click on your team's board to get in there. And then I'm going to launch the breakout groups now. And Erin or Dan, did you want to say anything else about the five Y exercise before we do that? Yeah, yeah, I can I can <clears throat> jump in here. So um, you know, once you get into your Miro board, you'll see that there's along the side next to the, the presentations, there's five, five steps. So we're going to be working step one to step three in the webinar today. Um, step one, you'll see there is your problem statement 1.0, and that's the problem um, that you're coming in with today. Uh, you haven't you haven't quite done any work on it yet, um, or the work that you've done on it is the work you've done to today. Um, step two is the five whys exercise that we're we're inviting you to work on over the next little bit. Um, you'll see there's five text boxes there that you're welcome to work in. So. As you take your problem statement, ask why, type it in the box, um, and move through those five whys as far as you can get. Um, and then we'll, we'll bring everyone back and, and uh, work on problem statement 2.0 from there. OK. Any questions before we start, or shall I open the rooms? Dan and Aaron will float in to check on you as well. OK. So hopefully everyone sees the rooms pop up there and just join the one that is associated with your team. How long do we have in these breakouts, Erin and Dan? We'll, we'll start with seven or eight minutes and we'll go from there. Okay. I, I don't actually see my room. Is it somewhere on the screen that we signed? It should into? be a pop-up. Yeah, you don't see anything, a prompt around joining a breakout room. I'll put you in, um, Eileen. Yeah, BC. Thank you. Oh, no. Okay. So those of you that haven't joined, I'm just going to start assigning you to your room. Hopefully that'll get you there faster. Okay, I think they're all in rooms now. Should we pause the recording? There we go, Dan. Um, do you want me okay. to pop, pop it up? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, and again, I realize that different groups are at different stages and still working on problem statements and other groups will have, you know, probably in some ways worked their way down and back the iceberg several times, but, uh, and I'm just trying to be as well cognizant of people's time. So um, did you want to, Aaron, do a little bit of uh, kind of popcorn or should we just wrap up? I do I'd personally love to hear from the groups if you've got yeah. the extra few minutes. Yeah, I think we've got a few minutes. Um, so yeah, I guess I'd just say, are there uh, any sort of insights that you gleaned from uh, looking at your problem statement and maybe beginning to start a work down the, the uh, iceberg model and asking some why questions? Is there uh, anything that, that you know came alive for you that was difficult, frustrating? Yeah, anything, any kind of insights, and just just feel free to, uh, you know, put up your your actual or virtual hand and go ahead. We'll just and because we have a bigger minutes. group, you can also drop something in the chat if you want. Yes. Yeah, yeah Michelle. Um, Michelle. Um, I think we're. So we don't have too much of a problem statement drafted yet. So we picked one of our topics just to work through the five whys. And um, I think maybe it's just clarity on if we were doing it right, because we're asking the first question about why. And then if we, there's so many different answers that we've come up with, but from our, or at least my understanding, it's from that answer, then you're asking why again from that answer you've created and then working down it. So I think that's just, 
Um, it's a good exercise because you're still thinking of all these things, but just trying to stay on topic <laughs> and following through of that why and the answer to the why. And there is, of course, no one answer. And the part of the idea here is that you can use this and you can, you know, reuse it and iterate. I iteration in any kind of systems approach is incredibly important. And you will mm -hmm. always find new insights the further you go. In fact, I'm about to go teach a, a, a third year course in systems thinking. And they're doing a system description of, uh, you know, a topic of their interest. And this is what I tell them. Don't, you know, try it, play, you know, do a bit of structured play trying to draw a systems diagram or a feedback loop, and then try again, you know, iterate, add nuance, ask different questions about it. And that's, you know, effectively what, what this was. So. And, and the fact that you're coming up with more than one answer to why you're already bumping up against the complexity involved in the pro project that you're working on. And again, watching for those areas there where you become, you know, disquieted, uncomfortable, scared, those are pieces that will also be, you know, important to kind of watch. Um, so, okay, Aaron, I think probably let's just go, uh, I'll put up a couple of, of, of quotes and things to, to leave you with. Um, and then, uh, and then I think we'll wrap up. Um, this is from a, a book by uh, David Peter Stroh. Um, and it's called Systems Thinking for Social Change. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a worthwhile text. Um, uh, and I just, I really love this, this quote because I think it speaks to what I was you know, trying to, to gesture towards in this session was, for any complex problem to be solved, the individual players all need to recognize how they unwittingly contribute to it. Once they understand their own responsibility for a problem, they can begin by changing the part of the system over which they have the greatest control themselves. The greatest opportunities for lasting change arise when all the players reflect on and shift their own intentions, assumptions, and behavior. And there's a related quote by Rama Rod Owen, or Rama or Lama Rod Owen, sorry, um, that is, if we don't do our work, we become work for other people. And I, and that's something that I try to really emphasize to my students that if we don't do this kind of work on ourselves, we don't try to build some of these capacities of. Um, Sharon Stein, a colleague of Vanessa Andriotti, refers to four H's, and there's many of these, but humility, hyper-reflexivity, honesty, humor. If we can practice those and do that kind of work, uh, we will hopefully be less work for other people. So yeah, I really I really like that quote. Uh, and go ahead, Aaron. And, and this is work, uh, this is from the work of Vanessa Andriotti, and I just want to flag this because I, I, she does some amazing work, uh, and I can provide a website uh, that, that she's posted a lot of her work around decolonial, it's called Decolonial Futures, um, and uh, she's written a wonderful book, it's, it's not an easy book, but it's a wonderful book uh, called Hospicing Modernity, uh, and it's a really potent, again, kind of systems-based uh, and kind of you know, in a way, psychotherapeutic uh, look at how systems change happens. And she also runs this course, which I'd also look into if I were you, called Facing Human Wrongs. And uh, she, in that course, she talks about these four denials, the denial of systemic violence and complicity and harm, the denial of limits of the planet, the denial of, uh, denial of entanglement, the denial of depth and magnitude of the problem. And I just think I, these are good prompts for when you get feel like you're get down, getting down to the bottom of the iceberg to ask some of these kinds of questions. And so that last one, the denial of uh, depth and magnitude of the problem, um, she, she highlights a couple of, of propensities or tendencies to one is to turn away from difficult and painful work. And the other is uh, to, to search for hope in simplistic solutions that make us look good or feel good. And oftentimes I know that I have been, you know, uh, guilty of that tendency. And so, again, I, I leave you with those sorts of challenges that when you're feeling like you might be getting down to the bottom of the iceberg to ask these kinds of questions about how are we reinforcing this or how is the system reinforcing these kinds of denials? Am I, am I looking for and hoping for simplistic solutions to what might be better thought of as a complex problem because they make, make me feel good? I might get a hit of dopamine. Uh, or they might make me look good. So anyway, I, I thank you for today. Hopefully this was uh, was helpful. And again, uh, happy to to follow up and uh, and you know answer any questions or provide resources. But I, I wish you well in your work and and thank you very much for your work. Thank you so much, Dan and Aaron, for supporting as well. Um, 
just a really great setup for us, I think, around developing these problem statements that can ground us in the work going forward and recognizing, as you've said, that they will continue to iterate and evolve. And that's what should happen as we continually kind of examine ourselves and go back to examining the spaces that we're operating in. So much appreciated. I know you have to run to teach a course now across campus, so physically need to get going. Um, but appreciate you being here. And um, we'll, the slides that you've shared today are available and we'll let you know if there's other questions and follow-ups that come up. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank so, you, everyone. Take care. <clears throat> uh, I see some thank yous coming in as well for you there. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, the idea is that um, this was a start, a bit of a kind of crash course introduction to the exercise of trying to define your problem spaces as teams. And from here, we hope that you will take this away. You know, if there's others on your team that weren't able to be part of the workshop today, you know, bring them into the conversation and, and start to figure it out and, and go through the five whys a couple of times if you need to. Um, but the goal would be for all of the teams to have at least an initial problem statement by the end of this month so that we can have that in place as you go into your inspiration trips and the other activities that you're going to be undertaking as part of the sensing and surfacing phase that you have a problem that you're working from. So um, we'll maybe just check quickly if there's any questions about that or, or follow-ups that anyone feels they need um, after that initial introduction. And then we'll move into the last half hour of our webinar, which is to talk about the integration of some of our action learning programs at Nourish with the cohort work. So are there any questions or, or feedback or comments just on that first hour and the exercise that we ran through? And Erin is still here as well to help with that. And I always need to give it a few extra seconds because I know people are shy to unmute or you're waiting to see if someone else is going to unmute. So hang in the silence with me for a minute while I see if anyone does want to raise their hand or say anything. Okay, well, scanning, I'm not seeing anything come up. So hopefully that feels pretty good. Um, I'll also follow up after this webinar with links to all of your mural boards in an email so that you have them there for reference. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch about that. But that's, that's the assignment is over the next few weeks to try to reach a problem statement for your team. Okay, so we're going to shift gears now a little bit, and I'm going to invite my colleague Meyer to share a little bit more about food as our medicine. So we did introduce this briefly at the launch event in Saskatoon, and some of you are familiar with um, food as our medicine already, may have actually already done the learning journey, which is great. Um, but Meyer, over to you to set us up here, and I will share my screen with those slides. Thanks, Robin. I can start by introducing myself. So, on a bonjour, my Greenfield Dishnikas, Giwenon Kwen Donjba, Kibwak First Nation, Endayang, Giwenon Kwed Endayang. My family's from Kibwak First Nation as well as um, North Bay. I have Irish, Italian, and French settler relatives. I live here in, in North Bay, born and raised, um, which is very close to Nipissing First Nation and as well as the Robinson Huron Treaty area. It's also Treaty Recognition Week in Canada. So I really encourage you to learn a little bit more about the treaty area that you're in or about treaties um, in general. Um, I've been working with Nourish for about three years now and I'm the um, Indigenous Programs Director. So I do work on foods and medicine, but I also work on Indigenous foodways programming and also building relationships um, with Indigenous communities that nourish. So we're really excited to share the food is our medicine um, animated learning, um, also known as virtual learning circles uh, with the cohort. Thanks, Robin. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide, there's just a small little agenda that I have today. We're going to go over what food is our medicine is and the different components that are the learning journey, um, which is our 15 hour, give or take, sometimes 30, uh, depending how deep you go, uh, course that's available online for free. And then also the virtual learning circles, which are set to begin in February of next year. 
and then some of the great resources that you can find online if you want to start a little bit sooner around health and Indigenous food waste. And then finally, the certificates that you'll receive when you complete the learning journey and the virtual learning uh, circle sections. So the next slide, please. Thank you. So Nourish worked alongside with the Nourish Indigenous and Allies Advisory, as well as Indigenous healthcare professionals and Indigenous system thinkers to create the Food is Our Medicine program. So we really wanted to build the understanding and the narrative that food is our medicine as Indigenous communities and people. Um, we understand that healthcare leaders were looking for knowledge and tools to decolonize food and healthcare. So we wanted to provide a base for folks to get going in these areas. And we also wanted to inspire action and engagement and responsibility around Indigenous foodways and healthcare settings. So if we go to the next slide, it was designed specifically for healthcare professionals who are interested in learning more about Indigenous perspectives, worldviews, and foodways, and for those who are committed to advance and reconciliation in their organizations. So it's really designed for physicians, nurses, administrators, um, food service teams, social workers, dietitians, and policy and program professionals. But what we're seeing too is folks from outside healthcare uh, walls are engaging. So universities, college students, teachers, professors, and food organizations, and also government institutes. So as you can see in these beautiful images, we worked with a design agency called BrightWeb, who I like to shamelessly plug every chance I get because they're so wonderful to work with and um, also an artist named Mariah Miwagasi to put together these beautiful images that depict or mirror the seasons that um, follow the learning journey. So we begin with an intro and then we travel through the seasons that begin with fall. So if you go to the next slide, um, basically in the first three first modules, the introduction, fall and winter, they really focus on the who and the why. So there's a lot of history, of why Indigenous foods and policies have come about and why our food is in the state that it kind of is in right now. And then you move into spring, which focuses on the what, what is happening now in healthcare and Indigenous communities with regards to Indigenous food waste. And then the final module of summer, which really focuses on the how, so the different ways that you can move ahead and bring Indigenous food waste um, and doing and ways of doing into healthcare. So this is available at no time um, for any, for no cost, <laughs> anytime for no cost. Um, you can sign up on the Nourish website and I can drop that in the chat after I'm done chatting here. Um, so feel free to share it with your friends or your colleagues or your family because anyone can do that. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, what is available just for the Nourish cohort and then probably in another 50 um, folks from different um, hospitals is the um, virtual learning circles. So this is a unique offering um, for the anchor cohort. So there's 20 spots available for each team. And if you don't have 20 members on your team, that's okay. You can share them with um, your, your health organization and community partners to join in. So what we're doing is we're asking the project leads to organize and send a list of 20 learners um, with their name and email to me um, by January 18th. And then I'll reach out to each participant um, to register for the circles and answer any questions that you might have. Um, the virtual learning circles will be in sync with the learning journey. So we will discuss the questions that are in the learning journey and kind of follow the seasons of, of our uh, in the circles. So um, I would like to encourage folks to step outside of their comfort zones in these circles. Uh, we won't be recording. Um, so they're meant to be a space for sharing and asking questions. But we also do understand that some might not feel comfortable um, sharing and that's absolutely okay. We respect this as well. I often prefer to listen and then I come up with my thoughts a little bit later or sometimes I keep them to myself. Um, yeah, it just depends on how I'm feeling. So we totally encourage folks to take the time to reflect and, and space that you might need. So each VLC will be uh, one hour. Um, so we're going to start them at two o'clock um, Eastern time on the Wednesdays that are listed here. So you will learn, you will receive a registration form from me. So I'll set you all up. So don't worry about that. But just to note, these are the times. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just going to share a little bit of an example of what we're going to be doing. So this is kind of an example from the fall um, meeting. So if we go to the next slide. Um, depending on the numbers that come to our circle, sometimes we have 50, sometimes we have 10. So we might ask you to share um, your reflections in the chat, or if you feel like it, or you feel comfortable, you can come on camera 
and share. And we'll also have an easy retro board, which I'll go through um, when we're together. And it's it's a really nice spot that you can um, share feedback and questions in an anonymous way too. And then we can track all the questions throughout the, the virtual learning circles. So we've, we've been doing this since um, the spring this year and our board's really nice with the circles that we have going right now. So I'm really excited to see what you all have to say. Um, so if you go to the next slide, We'll also provide a toolkit to promote the work that you're doing in your organization. We have beautiful posters that are downloadable and different social media shares that you can do as well. And then the last slide, thank you. There's um, also a plethora of resources that you can dive into at any time. And I'll share these links again after as well. So we do have an Indigenous Foodways library and then the Nourish YouTube channel, which is where you'll find lots of uh, information and then also anchor cohort videos too. So the last slide, um, last but not least, if once you've uploaded and finished all your PDFs for the learning journey, you'll receive a certificate of recognition and then you'll see, receive a second um, personalized certificate of completion once we finish all our circles. So that's about it. And I'm really looking forward to connecting with everybody in the new year, if not before. I know I'll see some of you, um, I think next week and maybe early December. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, thanks so much, Meyer. Um, so this is such a great opportunity um, for your core team members, but as well other folks in your organizations that you think could benefit from this learning. It's really integral to the way that we think about the change that's possible in our health system. So um, just a quick couple of minutes if anyone had any questions or, or wanted to say anything about what Meyer just shared any clarifications or if that feels pretty good, you've still got a couple months to think about who might use your 20 spots that each team gets uh, access to as part of your participation in the cohort. So ideally you'll compile that whole list and send it to Meyer one time versus as people continually to get at it, it gets be a lot for her to keep track of. So does that sound okay? Were there any questions for Meyer? Okay. Well, perfect. Don't hesitate to reach out to us if anything comes up. Um, but otherwise, looking forward to hopefully all of you taking advantage fully of this opportunity. So I'm going to pass it now to Amy. So Amy's the climate program manager on our team, and she's going to share about our other action learning series, which is planetary health menus. Thanks, Robin. I did a really quick scan of all the, the little Zoom squares, and I think I have met all of you on the call today. But just to remind you, uh, my name is Amy Ford. I'm the Climate Program Manager, as Robin said. And I am probably about five hours to the south of Meyer. I'm in London, Ontario. Um, and I am a 10-minute drive to Oneida Nation of the Thames if I'm driving above the speed limit, which I typically am. Um, so that's where you'll find me. And today we're going to talk about planetary health menus. So maybe I'll do a little a funny inside joke to the symposium, Robin, and like the Courtney Howard, I can just let you know when the next slide is coming, if you want to flip. So today we're talking about um, problems. That's been kind of the theme of today. And I'll, I'll bring your attention to a problem that we have, which is the current climate crisis. Um, so a third of the greenhouse gas emissions, which is kind of like a common way of being able to talk about this in, in a metric, uh, come from the food system. And that's everything starting from planting and growing and harvesting the food to processing it and distributing it where it goes to actually eating it and then disposing of the waste. That's a huge, huge portion of, of the problem. Uh, the other stat we talk about is 5% of these emissions come from healthcare. And that really is the intersection that all of us are talking about today, food and health. So I'll go to the, I'll, I'll do my Courtney Howard wave. So the Nourish response to this issue is a, a new program offering that's just released this June, a June of this year, it's called Planetary Health Menus. And uh, when we define planetary health menus on the next slide, we're talking about a few elements. So the first is that we believe the food should come from a process that was, we call it values-based procurement or just sustainable sourcing. And really connected to that is if you are buying locally, it's probably gonna be seasonal food. So whatever you buy is representative of the place that you are at the time that you are. 
The other one is that it's going to be plant forward. I'm not saying vegan here and I'm not saying completely plant-based, but largely comprised of foods that are good for the planet. Um, and then also with that, we want it to be culturally mindful, culturally diverse, culturally humble, many different ways we could would use that terminology. Um, and then the last one is reduced waste, waste with both food and also with packaging that goes to landfill. So these are the big pillars of what a planetary health menu might be. Um, but the the resources that we want to get out to the world so that we can move toward this idea of a planetary health menu is on the next slide. It's three elements so far, and they're part of an ever-growing library. So hopefully within your time with Nourish, you're going to see this screen of three maybe move to be four, five, six different things. The ones that exist now are the Sustainable Menu Guide. This was created actually by a food service manager who is uh, was part of the last co cohort, sorry. Um, and it has just about everything you could think of when it comes to making menu decisions. It's also a very beautiful interactive website. So you're going to enjoy the time that you spend with this guide. Uh, the next one is something that came out March of this year. Maybe it was April uh, called the Values-Based Procurement Primer. This is like a 101 guide to how to buy food in a good way. So you know what your organization's values are, or I hope that you do. How does that show up when you're actually choosing your suppliers, the contracts you sign, the places that you get your food? And then the last one is, I'm going to call it the meatiest one. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. Um, the Cool Food Pledge. So this is a pledge that an organization can take that they want to reduce the climate impact of their food. And there's actually a science-based target. So reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by the year 2030. Uh, this was chosen to be in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. And when I say organizations can take this pledge, it's not just healthcare. Actually, universities do it, municipalities, child care centers, all different groups are signing on to this pledge. Uh, so on the next slide, you can just see this is a, a partnership that we have forged with the World Resources Institute, and they've created a calculator that can take food purchasing records and turn it into a climate impact report. So actually tell you what are the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with those foods. And once you know that and you have this baseline data, then you're free to do any sort of interventions, projects, changes, enhancements, and go back to the calculator and see, did that have the impact that I wanted it to? And not only for your own self to know that the, the direction that you're moving is right and that your projects were successful, but it's a really nice way to show senior management and other stakeholders that you're on the right track and you've got this tangible thing that you can bring back to people. Uh, tons of groups are doing the Cool Food Pledge. They impact 3.5 billion meals per year. Um, of those, Nourish is now involved with about 4 million meals per year. So we're super proud of that. I've got a slide here just to say WRI does more than just um, food and quantifying climate impacts. They're working with oceans. They're trying to make sure we have lots of forests. They're, they're doing all sorts of things and they're a neat organization to learn about. Um, the next slide just tells you some of the big players that are doing this. And the fun thing about joining the Cool Food Pledge is that when you go on the member only webinars, you might be on there with like IKEA. So really big names. And, and sometimes you can actually be involved with these organizations and see the changes they're making, like go to Ikea and be like, oh, okay, that's why their food is getting better. So it's great to be part of this sort of community of practice. Um, next, Amy I just want to talk about- is also an ambassador for Ikea on the side, just in case- Apparently, I mean, look behind me. I think that's, <laughs> that's one right there. <laughs> um, so the timeline, um, and, and this is going to be relevant maybe to groups on different levels, because some of you are already involved with this, and some of you might just be thinking about what are our next steps. Um, but we're really trying to get everyone's food purchasing data in by January 18th. Uh, we are going to have a webinar that's all about how to pull this data and how to categorize it and what format does it need to get into. That's going to be later this month on the 30th, so I hope you can attend. Um, but really, by the time that you get your data in, it's a six to eight week wait to get your individualized climate impact report. And we have an example of what that looks like. A teeny little snippet of one of them. So you'll actually be able to see from all the different food categories that you um, purchase, how is that impacting your climate impact? And then you'll see on the side, um, it also is shown in a per 1,000 calorie metric because what some people found was 
their greenhouse gases were going up over time, even though they were doing better with their purchasing. And they realized that's because they'd opened whole new units or new wings or they had more patients. So it's kind of nice to be able to have that common denominator and know that you're improving based on a per calorie basis. Um, once you find out your climate impact, we're not just going to hang you out to dry. There's tons of really great resources to help you on your journey. So Cool Food has um, a progress report that shows how things are going like on a collective level. Um, maybe on the next slide here, we have this thing called the playbook. So these are suggestions for if you're nudging your menu in climate friendly ways, how to make sure the people eating the food are happy about it too. I know that can be a big anxiety is like, what if I start taking beef off the menu or are all the patients gonna be so ticked off? And this playbook kind of addresses that and it, it helps. Um, the next slide has some different specifics about how it's doing that. Some of these feel a little bit markety, like maybe you're not you know, making posters to your patients and residents, but these are particularly helpful for retail cafeterias and places where the eaters are making a decision in the moment. Um, so these are all really great strategies. And I think the last slide is just about some next steps. It's fun when someone else is advancing your slide because you're like, what's coming next? I think I know, here it is. Um, for the groups that have not signed Cool Food Pledge yet, but are interested, I'm gonna send out the agreement that your organization can take a look at and sign back. And then we'll just do some onboarding and give you more information. Uh, but the big thing to know is that our next webinar is coming up on the 30th at 12 Eastern. So I hope to see you there. And I can take questions too. Or if you in that time thought of some questions about food as our medicine, I think we can, anything at all related to action learning. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Amy. So some of you on this call I know are already signed on to the Cool Food Pledge, which is awesome. And you're part of Planetary Health Menus already. And for those that aren't, um, just great window into the opportunity on the climate side of the work as well. Were there any questions for Amy before we move to wrapping up? Okay, over the course of the next two years, you're going to get very used to me just like waiting a little longer than is comfortable in the silence, but I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Meyer and Amy, so much for sharing that. Um, this was some information we'd hoped to be able to include at the launch um, when we were together in person, but um, we had spent, I think, time well spent on introductions and our opening circle instead. So we had to cut this down, but wanted to make sure that everyone had all the information about both of those as well, because um, it will be part of your work in the cohort. And the Cool Food Pledge as well, just on the data side of things, um, is the climate data that we're asking teams to submit as part of that commitment to quarterly data contributions to our Nourish dashboard. And so it's a ready-made um, tool for you that will help you do that and make it really straightforward and clear um, with lots of support around how to do that and, and the questions that might come up related to it. So Amy, if we can share around um, that information before the webinar on the 30th, people can maybe just take a little look and then, um, on that, that webinar on the 30th, we'll be able to like get into the nitty gritty of questions that are coming up. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just have the one slide left now as we wrap up. Well, I might have two actually, um, but just to recap the next steps from the webinar today, and then we'll send all of you on your way for the rest of the day. So a couple of upcoming calls that we've talked about. So our project leads, we'll see you in a couple of weeks on November 23rd for our monthly meeting. Um, and then for the rest of you and your wider teams, as I said, you know, moving towards getting a, a finalized for now problem statement by the end of this month is the goal. And the problem statement work really ties into the inspiration trips or the activities that you're planning with your first grant for the sensing phase. Um, so we hope that it can be a place for you to vet and test some of your understanding of that problem space, to ask questions, and you know, you've got great learning opportunities some of you set up to be learning from other hospitals that are doing similar work to what you want to do or attending different events uh, in the community to talk to your community stakeholders about what's needed. So use those spaces to see, is this the right type of problem? Are we understanding it the right way? Is there anything that we're missing that we need to be bringing into our understanding of that issue so that it can be as deep 
deeply embedded in a variety of perspectives of people that um, have a stake in, in that issue so that the work that you do going forward can be informed by that. So take the time over the next few weeks to have those conversations in whatever format feels good for you. Um, Amy just spoke about our next cohort webinar, which will be November 30th at noon Eastern. So that's all about the cool food calculator. If you have data support teams in your organizations, I know some of the larger health authorities do, and you're going to be able to tap into some of that support around your data work and tracking your impact in the cohort, it would be really ideal to invite somebody from that team to also join that webinar so they can get some exposure to the cool food calculator as well. So that's an open webinar that you can add folks to as you feel appropriate. And then for January, the, the list of your food is our medicine learners. So the 20 folks that will take part in your virtual learning circles next year, um, sending those to Meyer, and then all of our sensing phase activities for the grants, um, aiming to have those wrapped up by the end of January. And you all have your final report template already for that, which will be due by March 1st. So that's kind of the look ahead over the next few months um, with a little break for the winter holiday in between. Um, but that is where we're headed for now. So I hope that this was a good chance to get set up and feel comfortable with the initial exercise. Um, were there any last questions before we wrap up around that or anything that's been shared today? You can always follow up with me, Meyer, Amy, Erin, or um, also our your project leads for your teams after if, if there's anything that comes up. We don't go away once the Zoom meeting closes. Um, so I'll send a follow-up message after today just so that you have um, the li links to your mirror boards. And then I'm also going to include one fun little thing, which is some advice to the next cohort, which those of you in Saskatoon will remember when we were sitting in circle and we all opened up those post-its and shared. Um, we put together just a little bit of a digital compilation of that advice so that you can have that as a record. So it's a sweet little resource to have on hand and it's just a, a little baton pass from the last cohort to you and your work to encourage you on your way. So I'll share that in the follow-up email as well. And if there's no other questions, I think that's it for today. So slides are available in your Miro board and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next touch point. Thanks so much for joining everyone.